indigenous people of color is our conversation for tonight and uh, how those voices are, are not being reflected in the, art, in the arts community especially. Uh, this is a conversation that's been, as, as I know our panelists are aware of this, this is a conversation that's been ongoing across the nation. Um, and it's been a most interesting one. I, I personally have observed uh, some very high profile art leaderships uh, be vacated because of this conversation. Uh, organizations discuss, there might be the fact that we, a lot of people, a lot of us on this, um, in their hallways, in their shows, they're leading their, I guess, better than never, but nevertheless, it's, it's an issue. It's an issue that is worthy of conversation. And before we launch into the questions, I just again to thank all of our panelists for the brave work that you're doing in leading this conversation here in the Pacific North. I am pretty confident in my own travel conversation that we are having, um, we're aware of, and they're picking up on. And I've been noticing a number of, uh, I have fielded a number of calls from, um, from uh, uh, small, you know, from organizations, uh, nonprofit organizations, wondering what kind of a plan can they put in place in order to uh, not only attract indigenous voices, to the work that they're doing, but also to, um, but also to identify what they're doing wrong. So uh, hopefully tonight's panel will add to that enlightenment. So if we will, let's begin with the questions that we have. And I'd like to start with Alicia, if you don't mind. Okay, first, you know, in our questions, what work does your organization do to uplift and amplify voices of black and people of color. And now I will get around everybody, all of our panelists. With, let's start off with Alicia. Hi. Uh, Hi. Yeah, I mean, I think um, we're a FUBU organization. So for those of you that don't know what FUBU means, it's for us, by us. Um, and so I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily look at the work of Wanawari as um, I look at it as like uplifting the voices of my people, right? Like, I, because I'm part of that community and um, telling the stories that I want to hear that resonate for me. Um, I talk a lot about us having a diasporic conversation about what Blackness is, because just as the title of the show, Blackness isn't a monolith. And so I'm interested um, as what Black people across the diaspora are really talking about and germinating on uh, what are the issues that are the same for all of us and what are the issues that are different. But um, for those of you that don't know, Wanawari is situated in fifth generation Black owned home in the Seattle Central District, which was our redlined community that was home to Black um, African Americans, um, Jewish Americans, and Asian Americans. Um, and due to redlining, and then over the last 20 years, it has experienced drastic gentrification. So we rent this historically black owned home and then give it back to the black community as an arts and cultural center. All right, thank you very much. And, and, uh, how, have you, and how have you found uh, the reception in the community to your mission? Not only your art mission, but also your... Um, yeah, we've been just like welcomed with open arms, which has been amazing. Um, even though we're in a community that is 80% white now, we have found that a lot of the people that moved into this neighborhood moved in at a time, um, well, I should take that back. Some of the people that moved into this neighborhood moved in at a time when they valued maybe a multicultural community. Um, and so having a space like Wanawari, they value it a lot they, and they believe it deserves to be here. And then of course, there's the people who moved into this neighborhood because they now see it as a white neighborhood. Um, and, but I think those people are on their own journey as well. And they're trying to learn more about the history of the neighborhood and see the value as they realize that they are also now, they realize that they are gentrifiers. They're trying to understand how they can kind of do some reparations around that. Sure, well, thank you for that. Selena. The question, uh, what work does your organization do um, feel uplifts and amplifies the voices of Black Indigenous people of color? Um, well, I'm with um, La Sala, which mm -hmm. means uh, the table in Spanish. And we uh, were started, I'm one of the co-founding members, um, 
back in the mid um, 2000s that because opportunity spaces for Latinx um, artists were rare. And so we were founded by a group of arts administrators and artists to create opportunities for artists um, throughout the region. And the interesting thing about our community is that we have had so many different names thanks to the Census Bureau and how people have identified us. So we, we have a variety of communities that we work with. Um, two uh, recent examples are we held two pop-ups in the community. Last year, we collaborated with Napantla Gallery in White Center for a month long interactive exhibit called the Concentration Camp to share the views of the immigrants that are held in deportation camps. And one of the artists um, that is in the COCA um, not your monolith exhibit, uh, Titiana Garmendia, who is a multi-talented artist. She was the filmmaker for that. So people could actually go up to a screen, press a button, visualize that experience. Uh, people were interviewed. Um, she filmed interviews with people as well as there was a literary um, ephrastic portion of that. And we got lots of positive feedback. Um, people want that, wanted that to be a traveling exhibit. And then the second pop-up that we did was a collaboration with Hugo House and uh, Movimiento Afro Latino Seattle, also known as MAS, which is an umbrella group of 14 different Afro Latino organizations in Seattle. And we did an evening uh, of literary music, film, food, and visual art called Silhouettes de Ebaño or Silhouettes in Ebony about four Afro-Latinas living in Seattle and the experiences that they had and it was standing room only. Um, and this was, a, it was interesting because we were having conversations with Hugo House at the time about what they're not doing um, to reach out to um, artists uh, of color who are writers. And um, they were a little, you know, they agreed to, you know, co-sponsor it with us, but it wasn't until they actually saw all the beautiful people that showed up that they were actually able to understand the impacts of having literary into languages in English, English and Spanish and the impacts on people to hear their words, to see their faces, to be able to connect with that artistic expression and experience. Um, and they definitely you know, said, oh, we want you to come back. <laughs> and so that means, you know, writing another grant. We are looking right now at planning for a home for um, Latinx, Afro-Latino, Garifuna artists in the South King County area. But right now we are looking at doing collaborations with existing um, entities and spaces. Excellent, excellent work. Thank you. Interesting comment that you made as, uh, regarding uh, the, um, once again, an organization that uh, feels that it should be doing the right thing. This is the, the group in which you worked, you mentioned that, that you worked with, that they only to, for them to discover that they, they don't really, they aren't really sure how they're going to go about that, which I find interesting considering, you know, probably the other. White Center of the area in particular, they exist in a very multicultural environment. So, you know, to have not, to admit that they've not made that much connection, it, it's an interesting thing. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Pritchard, welcome to the conversation. Um, and uh, the question that we are, that we've kicked off with is, uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, describe the work that your organization does. Uh, that uplifts and amplifies the voice of Black and Indigenous people of color. Well, thank you very much. And I'm uh, sorry for being in and out. I, uh, with all the, the Christmas uh, busyness of, with the family, I hardly get a, a break from uh, work. So today I kind of got lost in myself and totally forgot to get on the meeting on time. So I apologize for that. I'm Lua Pritchard. I'm the executive director of Asia Pacific Culture Center. We are a regional project. We serve statewide, uh, but we're located in Tacoma, uh, Pierce County. And uh, 
Our mission is to bridge communities and generations through arts, culture, education, and business, uh, meaning that uh, with uh, representing, uh, showcasing, and teaching about the 47 nations that make up all of Asia and all of the Pacific. And so uh, out of the 47, there are 39 active ones in the state of Washington. So we are starting uh, with that, but still with, uh, with the other countries, we try to do our very best uh, without uh, people actually being in Washington for that. Um, so we are inside of the schools from K to 12, we're in college. Uh, we are inside of businesses and we are also uh, out in the community uh, with uh, our big events throughout the year. So for example, last year, 2019, we served uh, 269,000 people. So that's, that's how large our uh, programs go. And with pandemic, uh, we didn't let it uh, get us down. We, we turned all our pro uh, projects and activities into virtual uh, programs that so we've been doing a great deal. So uh, we've done a lot for 2020 despite the pandemic. So uh, thank you for including me for today. And I hope to do some good and learn from all of you as well. Thank you. Well, th thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before we move any uh, too much further along, just a, a one more piece of housekeeping. Uh, for those who are tuning in uh, to observe, you do opportunity to lend your voice to the conversation. There are comments uh, probably will have no that. Uh, on your screen, I believe it's, it should be in the upper right hand corner of the screen for Zoom. And just simply uh, add in your comments and uh, Nat has graciously uh, agreed to, uh, to uh, field those comments and uh, refer them uh, to the audience when we reach that part of the program. Thank you. Uh, back to you, uh, uh, Kata. Um, you, you said you, you made in, in your opening remark that uh, I found uh, that actually dovetails quite nicely into a, into the next question. And that is um, how, how did you manage to uh, give us a sense of how, you, of how your organization managed to bring in a conversation like this? Um, to a setting that is not necessarily set up for inclusiveness or for, uh, for uh, diversity? Um, as Ms. Barnes will tell you, you have to be bodacious in this town in, in order to get what you want. And, um, and so I, I think, you know, part of the issue is uh, going to the leadership of any organization and um, pitching the whatever we want. I went to Tree Swenson at Hugo House and she wanted to meet with me. I think she was trying to recruit me to her board or some committee, which I don't have time for. I have enough with my own community. But um, I basically convinced her that she wanted to sponsor this pop up. And then it was, you know, she called somebody in. But I, I think, you know, there's, you know, that's why I'm so um, thankful to COCA. And I want to, you know, thank everybody here from COCA, um, you know, Ms. Barnes and, and uh, Ms. Thornton um, and Mr. Reed on giving us opportunities to collaborate with you because you've always been a wonderful collaborative partner from, from many years ago. We've done many things with with COCA and you've always been open to us doing that. But I mean, I think for the for the bigger organizations, you have to figure out who the decision maker is and and go to them and don't take no for an answer. <laughs> Alicia, can you pick up on that one? Can you repeat the question? I mean, I heard oh, it. <laughs> oh, okay. No, gladly. As I uh, start, I lead, my lead to the question was a curiosity as to how uh, getting a sense of how organizations such as yours um, go about um, bringing people into the conversation of inclusiveness, at least uh, to the extent that we're talking today. 
really don't have a lot of experience with that or their systems just aren't set up for that, for that kind of work. Yeah. Um, trying to think of a good, <laughs> I, I have lots of answers swirling around in my head. Um, uh, I guess what I'll say, so I think, like I'm gonna I'm gonna take this from the vantage point of like if you were an if you're an arts organization, and you're mo mostly white, like what steps do you need to take to actually start diversifying and decolonizing your work? Um, and I think one that is obviously hiring people of color, but also um, there's a document called um, White Supremacy Culture, and it's valuable. You can Google it. Um, but there's some tenants that like what happens a lot is people will hire people of color. And then they're put in an environment where they're still basically supposed to, you know, um, act within the tenets of white supremacy. Um, and then they get burnt out, um, constantly pushing up against that system. And so I think that's true for any organization, especially arts organizations. Like, how do you actually bring artists of color into your organization and make sure that they are their full and whole selves? Um, how do you change the way that you operate to make it much more accessible for them? You know, so, I mean, a good example is um, I have a call out that closes tonight as a consultant. Um, and I've known an artist for years uh, who only speaks Spanish. And I worked with a friend um, who speaks Spanish to be able to get him to submit his um, application, right? So you have to kind of think on your feet and open up these boundaries and, or think, you need to think that there are no boundaries to you being able to reach the communities that you want to reach um, and get the voices that you want to get. And then the work that he submitted was like so perfect for what we're looking for. Obviously a panel will select it and not me, but it was like, I can't let the barrier of me not speaking Spanish um, be something that's gonna get in the way of me finding the right artist for the projects that I need. So that's that's what how I would start that. Um, and, you know, again, I, like I said, Wanawari is very much about um, taking up space for black people in this neighborhood where we've been you know, in a lot of ways erased or displaced and being very, um, very black and very much ourselves um, and unapologetic about that. But, um, but like I said, um, our whole leadership structure is set up where the people of color are leading. So it's just a little um, different or it's the same as Lasala, but I don't think, we also talk a lot about like, we don't wanna think about ourselves in terms of whiteness um, we want to think about ourselves in terms of blackness, um, and that's a kind of a different way of thinking. Ms. Richard, the uh, Pacific Islander population has been, uh, been a part of the Pacific Northwest for quite some time, but yet I'm, uh, I, I've often been, my own work, um, I've often been rather curious as to uh, uh, why uh, the recognition of um, of Pacific Islander native populations have been so slow in coming uh, here in the Northwest. Could you shed a little light on that for us, please? Well, Pacific Islanders are there are not that many of us, so we're we're um, we're just now uh, coming up, and it's growing um, pretty fast. <laughs> Um, in the in the northwest, uh, believe it or not, so a lot of people are moving from Hawaii and and other uh, states uh, into the northwest because um, typically number one reason is because of the economic status of um, you know how expensive it is to be in Hawaii or or the other uh, states compared to the. Uh, their feelings and also they like the weather. The weather here in the state of Washington, for example, is very good for us. We are islanders, but we typically don't like the heat. So uh, that's I know that's why I'm in Washington. <laughs> but um, Pacific Islanders uh, and Asians, uh, you know, we're all different from each other. Well, we're all our own countries and and uh, and we're racist of each other too. So we have our own racism uh, situation. So uh, that we're working on, uh, and and it's all about learning and being educated about each other too. That's why uh, our organization, Asia Pacific Cultures, and it's very important 
it's not only teaching the world who we are as the Asia Pacific um, um, people, but also it's teaching amongst ourselves. Uh, you know, Koreans learning about who the Samoans and Hawaiians and vice versa and Chinese and Japanese and things like that. So, but the Pacific Islanders is uh, coming up, whether we like it or not, <laughs> uh, particularly in the sports area where football, you know, that's really um, yeah. helping yeah. a lot too uh, yeah. in bringing out the, the Pacific Islanders. Well, that the comp that 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 complicated line, I think, um, when you're working with an organization that is not one that is familiar, very familiar with uh, people who are Blacks, Indigenous people of color, and at the same time, uh, they're asking uh, for uh, guns from uh, from an organization such as yours. Which is also wrestling with the that same question on an even probably an even grander scale that you just painted. Um, how can you take shed a little light on course on on how that strategy works? So you know, I, I'm not really quite sure because I you you keep getting cut off. I don't know oh. why. So oh. I, I I didn't. I'm not getting all of your uh, speaking um, moments, but um, so are you? Can you repeat, Eddie? What one more time? Oh, no problem. That I found I uh, commenting. I uh, you know one thing that for me was a dual challenge that you just spoke of within your own organization to educate on a broader community of Pacific Island, recognizing what that community is. And at the same time, you're, you are being asked or reaching out to, to uh, well, non-organizations that are not organizations of color. How have absolutely. you managed to navigate? And absolutely, Eddie, you're, you're absolutely right. And there's a grander stage on my side because uh, grander in the sense of uh, a lot more work to do. We, we're, as we're dealing with uh, racism within our own selves. And then at the same time, we have to deal about with the rest of the world. Uh, so fortunately, we are partner in partners with uh, so many African-Americans and Latin, Latinx um, organizations who are also nonprofits, but we're, we're very close net. Uh, that's what's good about Pierce County uh, and Washington State. Um, the people, the communities are, are really, really close netted. So it's, um, and, and it depends on the leaders too. So we, we have so, mm. we have an extensive uh, network of uh, partnerships so that we could learn from each other. Uh, also, we have to uh, make sure we understand a lot of our people are also intermarrying. You know, we're marrying, a lot of our people are marrying Black people and Black people marrying our people, you know, white people and all that kind of stuff. So it's the world is a mix, you know, whether we like it or not, it's becoming a mix every single day. So uh, that's why uh, I have, I have even, even myself, I have grandchildren who are half Black and you know, so and and some are a part Mexican, and and so it's 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 a it's it's that kind of world that we and we that's why we need to to really understand each other and get along and and you know there's there's and understand each other that why why in the world uh, we 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 have to be so different you know so but the main thing is we're people and we need to look far and beyond the color of the skin and and where we're from. So person is a person. Well said. Um, one, one of the things I step on on late and it with uh, friends on this is uh, I, I pay attention to, uh, to uh, commercials. The reason being because I recognize that America by and really takes its we, we marketed environment. We really take our are particularly the marketing scheme that goes your primary TV commercials. Of course, there's print 
generally TV up there. And I relate that uh, the world of Madison Avenue for the multiculturalism of America and um, do the very things that, that Ms. Pritchard just pointed out. It's showing, uh, it's showing relationships along racial lines, a uh, gender line. And uh, that's, uh, that's, that's an interesting thing. Has anybody else picked up on that? Uh, panelists, have you noticed kind of this kind of shift that's going on in um, uh, recognizing or at least encouraging the American populace to recognize more a multicultural uh, America? And anyone can start that one, any of the Well, I think uh, Lau picked up on an important point about how uh, we're all becoming a little piece of each other. And, um, and so we have to learn more about each other. And yeah, there's definitely racism and colorism in the Hispanic, Latino, Spanish speaking community that goes back to the, the colonialists from Europe that went around and colonized all the different places, um, but you know there was an African. Um, there were African people that came to Mexico, Central and South America. There was a trade route between Acapulco and Manila. Um, so there's there's a whole Filipino community in Mexico. Um, Spanish is spoken differently between the Caribbean, Mexico, and South America. So um, there are people in the United States who don't speak Spanish. Um, so it's, it's all part of how do we learn more about each other and respect each other because we are becoming the largest um, group of people in this country. Hmm. Yeah, very good, good point, good point. Um, Alicia, in your last comments, uh, you made a remark about how one can come to an organization, I'm paraphrasing, so forgive me, but how one can come to an organization that is listening or insight on how uh, to uh, create a more welcoming environment for indigenous people of color, but yet that conversation has to end up being a silo where it stays at the top, but is not necessarily filtered to the organization. Um, that one, uh, I'm curious about uh, uh, and would like a little more from you, if you don't mind, on that. And the reason I'm curious is because you took back to, I'm going to date myself, you, I had a flashback back to uh, my in college in 1971, and I'm sitting and I'm just waving my hand like crazy. And the instructor, looking right just the whole is going to people me to the left of me so class uh, I wait around till everyone asked the and asked the instructor who was still around with his papers I said sir you know excuse me but you know I'm, and I'm just trying to figure out what the protocol is in your class to you know to get to ask questions and he looks he he looks up and he looks at and he says, well, protocol, I just don't believe you belong. <laughs> so, so that's a curious part of the scholarship student. Basically, I was invited in that school. But, you know, that, and that, that really is what put me on the path investigating this whole phenomenon around leaders and organizations, especially under the umbrella that we're talking about tonight. So how do you go about, my question in that is, how do you go about getting uh, a conversation such as this, that is respecting equity, um, uh, understanding that, that peoples of all types have a lot to contribute to the organization. How do you get it out of the, how do you get them to get it out of the silo and ensure that that message is filtering through the organization as a whole in order for your efforts not go wasted. Oh, that was uh, kind of a big question. <laughs> um, yeah, but I think that's kind of why I was talking about that whole, you know, idea of like um, white supremacy culture and decolonizing 
Um, you know, I mean, recently, um, I've gone on a couple studio visits recently um, with Black artists. And it was interesting because all of them had said that when they showed their work to white curators, they didn't understand it. And the work to me was like blatantly obvious. To, like there was, I was like, I don't know why anybody wouldn't understand this. And so I, I'm, you know, I'm bringing that up because I think people need to be able to see like their own blind spots as they're doing this work, right? Um, and that you might not actually understand it or you might need to bring in some other like content experts or experts from that culture to be able to work on, do this work. So if you don't have the people on staff, um, and I think people just need to bring people into their community. I mean, so I guess that's why I was like, this is like a really huge topic. <laughs> and I'm like, how do I answer this in one question? But like years ago, I used to just say like, do you have any friends of color? Which sounds like a kind of a silly question, but, um, and you know, not in this call, like I have a black friend way or I have an Asian friend way, but like, do you have people that you're in relationship with, right? Because you could be at work talking about anti-racist stuff all day long, but if you actually don't have people that you love that you're willing to fight for, um, like that type of relationship, you're not actually going to really get to the point where you really wanna do real anti-racist work, right? I have trans and non-binary friends who I love very much. And so that has shifted very much over the last 10 to 15 years about how I think and work with trans and non-binary people, right? Be um, because it's because of people I care about first, not because somebody told me I need to. Um, so one is just like, don't tell me that your, or your organization or anything you want to do anti-racist work and then you don't have any of those people in your community. And you need to go out and look at work, see work by people who are doing that work in communities of color, small organizations, and then bring them into the fold, um, kind of just the way COCA did, you know, and uplift their voices in a way that's not like co-opting what they're doing. Um, but yeah, the work of like actually bring, doing this work in, organization takes very long, takes a very long time. I know that was, oh, <laughs> it's was oh, that's very good. Thank you. I really <laughs> appreciate it. It is, it is a, but yet at the same, uh, social is the technical term is to put to the, it, it, it's one of the big challenges in moving a, an organization to a, a more inclusive stance. Um, I mean, you, you just, you have to uh, ensure and make sure that others, in, that all in your organization who come in contact with or who would come in contact with the audience that you're tending as an organizational leader to bring a more presence to in the organization itself. You have to make sure that they understand what's going on and that they are receptive to that. And um, because, you know, it's it's easily, work is easily undone. You know, that's one of the challenges. Catalina, how has your organization managed? What's the strategies that your organization has used to get the converse, to make sure the conversation of acceptance, if you will, and inclusiveness moves out of the silo and into the, you know, to the mainstream of the organization itself? Um, well, it's always been a challenge for us because we're a volunteer organization. So we're always seeking spaces belonging to and controlled by others to share Latinx art. Um, and that's why one of our long-term goals is to create a space, um, a permanent home for Latinx arts in the greater Seattle area. And um, what we have done is we've negotiated, um, you know, partnerships with existing spaces uh, we do most of the work ourselves, um, and that includes often paying the artists from our own resources when partner spaces will or cannot. Um, you know, handling a large part of the logistics has at least allowed the artists to work more freely and without exposure to the, the politics. I think there's a lot of politics in the art world. And oh, really, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay. I was just looking at um, an organization that just had another shakeup um, with a number of people and they're looking for a racial equity person. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I do this every time I go to an event, I start counting how many people of color in the audience are on the panel. Um, but I looked at how many people of color were on their 
um, board and it was really white. Um, and I mean, they, were, they had an indigenous person, they had an African-American person, there were no Latinx people. I think there was an Asian person. Um, and so I think the other issue is that the same leadership keeps getting called on to do so many things. And so I think we have a duty to mentor younger people to become the arts leaders and the arts administrators in the future so that they can you know, take over the work that so many of us have worked on um, all these decades. Well, and I'm, I'm gonna jump in and just add to that, sure. but like people don't get paid that much in the art world um, and that, that has to be fixed, right? Because historically, you know, um, it's been a lot of white women who have had access to, you know, intergener intergener intergenerational wealth who have been able to work in the arts. And right. so, you know, as we put people of color in those positions, they need to be paid in a way that they can actually sustain themselves. But yes, absolutely. I, really I would like to sure. add on that as well, in the sense that um, arts and arts and culture it, world is very political uh, and very racist at times. Um, for many years, for example, all the the big funding organizations for arts and culture is all white, and so uh, we're just now mixing. Uh, and I can speak for Pierce County, Seattle area, Washington, that it's just now trying to mix. Uh, but it's been slowly trying to mix as well, but it's now even more so trying to mix uh, because of what's happening now in the world. But but I tell you, all the funding used to uh, us uh, people of color organizations with the arts, it's been hard trying to get funded uh, because uh, all the, the, the white organizations have uh, already know how to compete for the money and already have insight to the funders and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that's a, that happens. That happens, been happening and still needs to be corrected. I, I, I couldn't agree more. That's a big challenge. Uh, I, was, I sat on the board of of uh, the music industry for a while. And um, um, I was the only person of color for, for uh, a couple of years, and then a, a couple of, of us were brought on. But what was interesting to me during that I was there, that uh, the intent of the organization was not to interact with, uh, with uh, peoples of color or indigenous people within their programming, the intent of the organization was to deflect criticism that they not uh, look at the community in the Northwest looks, uh, speaking. I, I often, you know, in at which I often did, as some of you can tell a lot. So in, in, uh, in to that, it, there wasn't seemingly a big, interest there was concern and the concern pretty rooted in the the uh task that everyone felt within that organization was being asked is that diversity to them meant that you're taking away something if we uh if we bring in then what are we removing uh that interesting note to me i'd like to hear from from, from if you, if you, uh, on that point, um, why do you think that that is typically the reflex reaction when, when that term is used in an organization? That we are talking about taking away something from the organization as opposed to looking at the quality that could be added to the organization? Um. I, th I think it's an, you know it's just like another popular word that somebody came up with to make themselves feel better. Um, diversity implies that one must conform or assimilate to a space as it already exists, whereas inclusion 
implies a recognition of the difference between people and an acceptance of that difference. So it's incorporated into and changes the space. And I think that's where we need to be going. That the whole respect, what what Ella Shiva was talking about is, you know, artists of color feeling like no one is understanding their art. Um, and, you know, how do we help, you know, bridge that uh, for BIPOC artists? Um, it's, it's a very complex problem and simply increasing the number of BIPOC people in a space gallery or museum does not address the underlying issues that allow these spaces to be so white centered in the first place. People always confuse diversity with inclusion. Yeah, I think I'll be that it's like a lack of, I think that white people are in a critical moment where they have to, um, you know, be imaginative. It's like a lack, it's a lack of imagination. So I've been in conversations with white artists where we've had really intense conversations where, you know, basically we determined that the topic matter that they wanted to discuss might not be appropriate based on, you know, where they sit in society, right? And, um, and then their response to it is always like, well, if I'm a white man or I'm, you know, maybe I shouldn't just make art, right? And it's like, there's tons of white people making really great art. You need to go deep, <laughs> go back, go deep and not appropriate anybody else, not do, you know, find stories that are not your own and do some like internal introspection. And I just think because they've been in the dominant, um, you know, dominant in terms of power and all these other ways that they haven't had to do that much work. I think Ijoma's book is called Mediocre. <laughs> Ijoma Lou's new book, right? Because I think some people have been able to reach a certain place in their career just based on like who they know and whiteness. So um, of course it's gonna feel like you're taking something away, but actually you just need to like level up because black and brown artists have actually had to like always been doing way, way more just to be able to try and think they can get into your space. Um, and so it's time for them to level up to where we're at. Great response. Thank you. Thank you all three. Uh, um, we're at the point of our programming now where uh, we want to turn to the questions that have come. Uh, we have two of them actually. So uh, let's obviously we'll begin with the first one asked. And the question is, how do, how do BIOPOC groups sustain the integrity of cultural aesthetics when there is so much push for being, uh, for being, uh, uh, that's an acronym I'm not familiar with, woke, W-O-K-E, with a dominator culture inserting their needs. Uh, who would like to take that one on? What is woke? <laughs> it basically, uh, woke is um, this idea that you are kind of post-racial, that you're anti-racist, that you're doing all the work, but you might not really be. Like you're just, you look like you are, but you're not doing the hard work, I guess. Oh, okay, interesting. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. Uh, anyone care to comment? Any of our panelists care to comment on the question? Can you read it again, please? Oh, sure. Um, to uh, how do uh, groups integrity of cultural aesthetics and there is so much push for being uh, woke, dominated culture inserting their needs. I, 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 I sense that this next with the, uh, with the uh, conversation that we were having earlier around um, social construct. Uh, you have, on one hand, you have an organization, you have a culture that wants to be more inclusive, but on the other, hand, it gets in its own way with its long uh, systemic practices. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, again, I'll just like hearken back to the title of the show, Not a Monolith. Um, you know, and obviously we're a Black arts organization. So um, one of the ways that we, we get around that is not expecting Black people to make Black art. Like I said, when I talk about the ideas of the diaspora, 
that could be anything, right? An artist might be just interested in nature, which is still about Blackness. Um, and so we, I try to create space for the artists that I work with to kind of explore whatever they want to explore um, and not feel like they're being um, pigeonholed into, you know, a racial category. Um, so I think, again, that goes back to like, how do you respect like somebody's wholeness, their fullness, their full being, um, where I think what, the, this question kind of feels like it's talking about like people picking people because they think that they're talking about something of the moment or something political of the moment and not really letting artists that maybe don't have that voice, you know, that aren't social practice artists or, you know, political artists, they feel like they can't just express themselves and, you know, do watercolors or something, so. Sure, thank you, thank you for that. Our next question and, and the only one that's in, the only one that's in the questions uh, that remains for us is what resources would you suggest your audience seek out uh, to learn and broaden their horizon? Who would like to take that one? So there are so many, um, I don't know about anywhere else, but in the state of Washington, there's so many of, of our organizations um, that we can lean on to and get involved to and partner with. So, um, the, 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 it's very open. And we, when we, when we deal with artists and, and cultural uh, artists and so forth, so we, we kind of encourage them to fly, you know, not, not just to be, um, to think that APCC is where they, they can stop. Uh, we also encourage and also help them with the with other resources and be a part of other uh, so many of, of what's a, available and open in the world. So uh, so we have Asia Pacific artists and cultural performance performers, but um, we 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 try to hook them up into all so many different kind of avenues because it's it also helps them live what we're trying to do is you know in diversity and inclusion and you know to learn about it it's about learning about others and it's about helping others and so that's what we try to do at at APCC it's not just be with ourselves and our own country you know we try to also share countries and we also know how what countries abroad are not getting along. So we try to make them get along here, for example, you know? So, uh, and then they all have histories. They all have histories that we could possibly make better at times because some some of them are, some of our people are still dwelling on the history of those, of their countries, you know, against each other. So, uh, so our whole thing is about opening up the world you know, because a lot of us come to America because it's the land of opportunity. So we we think, oh, um, we're in America. There's so much out there to touch on and 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 do with. You know, so we encourage that a lot. Very good. I'll just add, um, like I said, you can Google the white white supremacy culture document, and then I would recommend Vuli um, is a really incredible. Um, writer who's been writing about this for years and um, his blog is called non Nonprofit AF. Um, and so uh, he talks about um, white organizations and what they need to do to kind of um, <laughs> come to the future and become decolonized. Um, and I would invite everybody to come to a La Sala event. We had one, uh, we had our first online pop-up this past summer called the Tartillada. Um, and, and we did it online and we had um, a Garafuna group, which is an Afro-Latino group from the Caribbean. Um, and we had a dance group and we did studio tours and we did um, lo lots of kind of interactive things. So, you know, I was gonna put in the ch chat um, our, you know, to sign up on our email address, um, attend events, follow the organization's social media, follow the artists we work with, 
enjoy, sit back, learn, and observe. And allies shouldn't push themselves to the forefront of these communities, but they also shouldn't feel hesitant to attend and experience our wonderful artists, because that's the best way to learn is to experience the artists because artists want to share. If you're an artist as I am, you definitely wanna share your art with other people. And it's all sort of, um, as everyone said here, it's all an interactive process and it's an education process as well. Um, so I welcome everybody and I will put our um, email in the chat. Very good. Uh, um, well, very, very important. Um, uh, Point, excellent point. Uh, the art world is often viewed as a, as a commercial marketplace. And uh, that tends to get in the way of when you have, uh, wanna have conversations about inclusion, does it um, boil down or not? The, the uh, um, audience of buyers are uh, to the eye of uh, looking at a voice a, a voice that familiar with a cult voice, they're not there. And sometimes I often feel that that uh, and galleries tend to um, tend to want to back away from having to push that particular envelope. Anybody care to share their thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with selling work. <laughs> I may not be the right person to ask. I'm also an art dealer. I mean, I feel like that's how artists get paid. Uh, again, I think it's leveling the playing field so that all of the collectors aren't just um, rich white folks um, who are only interested in legacy artists like, I don't know, Keith Haring and Basquiat or whatever, but um, really getting people to understand that they need to um, invest their dollars into local artists so that they can survive and thrive. Thank you. I think that the, the question that we have is um, around appropriation. Does appropriation provide an opening for a standard in the recognizing value of our art? And I'm assuming uh, our meaning of the art of black and indigenous uh, peoples of color. So how, how, do, how does your organizations go about that? Okay, I'll do the question. Um, I, you know, I think a, um, a lot of artists, uh, when they look at the, the work, they see it as either craft or folk art. Um, they don't see it as quote, fine art. And um, I think that's another example of the European forms of art as fine art, high art, um, what's seen in books. Um, yeah, I've been to the Prado. I've been to you know, European things and seen dead people on horses that are life-size. It just didn't rock my boat. <laughs> it just, I mean, who are these people and why are they on the wall? But, um, but yeah, when I saw the Guernica, yeah, my heart stopped. My heart stopped when I saw that and how Picasso looked at uh, genocide. And um, that still, every time I think about it, I almost start crying. So just bear with me there. But I, I think we really need to look at dedicated spaces for BIPOC artists that are fully controlled by the artists and the communities they represent. But what do we do? Because there's already you know, galleries, theaters, performance areas that were built with millions of dollars and what are those existing entities doing to be more inclusive with their spaces and reaching out to collaborations with BIPOC communities and artists? And follow up on that, what's the harm in doing that? Um, you know, where, what is the root of the resistance within the organization to make that and uh, to open up those opportunities to a diverse uh, society. What's the challenge? Where's that's, the fear? That's, that's that. Well, the fear is definitely not on our end. So. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah. I mean, I think well, you know, they just haven't been. 
so like, you know, as a person of color, like we go and see all movies, right? I mean, nobody's seeing movies right now. We're in a pandemic. But like, I might tell you, you know, tell you, like, I love Eternal Sunshine on the Spotless Mind, which is, you know, basically a white movie, right? But it's got these really complex um, ideas. And I think white folks are so used to us going to their stuff and then seeing our own stuff that, but they don't actually push themselves to go, you know, the first time I think in a long time where many white people went to go see a non-dominant um, white or a non-white movie was like Black Panther, right? And then they were like, oh, this is exciting, this is fun, right? Um, so I think it's the lack of imagination again, right? Where they are only looking at stories or art from their own history. Um, and they need to actually open up and see that there's other stories that might resonate with them on a really, um, you know, an incredible level if they were open to it. That's why Alex Haley's Roots was, was such a revelation with, with communities of color. Um, we learned we learned much about ourselves because of what has been what was absent in our own education. So that's an excellent point for that. We are uh, uh, near the end of our programming, and um, I once once again would like to thank uh, all who have participated with their questions and for uh, tuning in. Coca certainly appreciates that, um, and we'd like to encourage uh, everyone when. Uh, to uh, look into uh, Wanuari or uh, the Asian Pacific Cultural Center, uh, La Sala, and um, try to learn a little bit, not only about those organizations, but about your own thinking around uh, inclusiveness and uh, around um, uh, the broader multicultural world in which we, which we live in. Uh, I wanna thank our panelists again. Uh, Alishaba, thank you very much. Absolutely wonderful to meet you. Um, uh, Lau, Ms. Pritchard, thank you. I really appreciate it. And Kantu, I really thank you again for uh, taking the time and uh, being a part of our broadcast. This broadcast has been recorded and uh, will and be posted if you to review it or for your friends uh, to uh, it. We would really appreciate that. This is, uh, this is the Center on Temporary Arts effort, ongoing effort to broaden the base of which the conversation uh, and recognition of the cultural world and, and what value we have brought to that world, we being Black, Indigenous, people of color. Thank you again, everyone, for joining. Appreciate it.